All right, we'll get started with immunotherapies. Thanks, Walker. Alrighty, I'm here to introduce Dr. Alex Wong. He is a physician, scientist, and professor of pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, director of the University Pediatric Immunotherapy at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, Angie Fowler, AYA Cancer Institute in Cleveland, Ohio. He also serves as director of the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Fellowship Program at UH Rainbow, co-director of the Medical Scientist Training Program at the School of Medicine and Code Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. His lab investigates immune responses to cancer and explores translational opportunities to enhance immune-mediated therapeutic approaches to osteosarcoma. Thank you, Walker. Thank you. And thanks, Walker. I hope we didn't disrupt your uh, enjoyment of lunch that uh, you look so Look for, looking forward to. Um, welcome to this session. We have a very special session for you for immunotherapies, um, and you can see that we have a, a, list, uh, a, a long panel of uh, excellent speakers, and uh, because of the number of speakers, we actually will be breaking into two halves for, for this afternoon session. Um, we will have the first four speakers that will be talking a little bit about uh, targeting myeloid uh, compartments. Um, as well as tumor intrinsic factors that might drive the immune response. And in the second half of the speakers, we'll, then, we'll have a 10-minute Q&A. Following that, we'll invite the second half of the speakers to come up, and they'll give us uh, some more discussions about a different subset of T-cell therapy, as well as antibody-based therapy and radioimmunology. So without further ado, I'll um, uh, introduce uh, the speakers very quickly. The first speaker will be uh, Dr. Milner who um, is the, uh, the Hill, Hills Endowed Professor of Oncology and a Director of, of Clinical Translational Research. Uh, he holds affiliate appointment at the University of Florida College of Medicine and is part of the Pediatric Cancer Immunotherapy Initiative. Um, he's developed cancer immunotherapies as an adjunct to cancer standard of care. So he will be the first speaker um, and will be followed uh, by Julia Metlin, who is from University of Minnesota. Um, and she's a medical oncology resident at the University of Minnesota Veterinary Medical Center. And following the completion of her residency in July, she will be staying on as a clinical assistant professor at the medical oncology. Um, her research interests center on immune, uh, immune, immune landscape of osteosarcoma and the development of novel, novel immunotherapies in dogs as a translation uh, model of a naturally occurring osteosarcoma. She will be followed by Dr. Brian Lado from Hop, uh, Johns Hopkins University, who is a practicing uh, pediatric oncologist, a pediatric uh, sarcoma expert, and translational immunology researcher at Hopkins. Um, I was given this um, factoid uh, that his uh, fifth grade science fair project was titled Cancer, and his sixth grade research project was titled The Immune System. So, <laughs> so. In, in 97, as a sophomore in college, really, 97? Um, <laughs> I'm a little older than that. I think, okay. Um, he, he watched uh, Dr. Rosenberg uh, from NIH on, uh, in a science show called NOVA and describing a, a new cancer therapy called adoptive T-cell therapy. So bringing together his longstanding interest uh, and now um, you know, researching in this area. And the goal is to, to be able to uh, be an oncologist and cancer researcher devoting to developing novel therapies. Um, and then this, the first session will be then uh, end with uh, a talk from Dr. Betsy Young from uh, UCSF. Um, she is a physician scientist at the Children's Hospital there, um, and she's conducting translational research in the laboratory of Dr. Alejandro Suicodero, uh, where she focuses on elucidating the role of the sting pathway in osteosarcoma immunotherapy, or immune responses and invasion, and designing novel therapies. Uh, to combat that. And then we'll have a Q&A session followed by a talk from uh, Dr. Antonella uh, Rotolo, who is from University of Pennsylvania. And she's a research uh, assistant professor in immune, immunobiology at the University uh, Veterinary School. Uh, she's building on 10 plus years of experience in working with invariant NKT cell-based adoptive cell therapy. Um, and she's established a canine invariant NKT cell therapy that will provide a valuable link between mouse preclinical models and human clinical trials. Um, she will be accompanied by uh, Kate uh, Dedekova, 
who is from University of Saskatchewan, and she is uh, the chair of radio pharma uh, pharmacy at uh, her local institution and a professor of the College of Pharmacology and Nutrition uh, at the University of uh, Saskatchewan. Her laboratory has pioneered radio immuno immunotherapy of uh, infections and other research interests um, in combating uh, osteosarcoma as, as one of her goals. Um, the session then will end with a talk from Dr. Janet Yoon from City of Hope. Uh, she's a clinical professor and a medical director for Pediatric Musculoskeletal Tumor Program at City of Hope. And she's also the director of the Pediatric Clinical Trial Program at the City of Hope. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite uh, the, the first speaker to come up and I will release the three speakers who will come up in the se second session so we don't hold them hostage for two hours. They, um, here. Thank you so much, Alex. And I now know why everybody on this panel through the last two days looks really as if they're, though they're in the spotlight. Well, we are, because these lights are really bright. <laughs> so if, we, if we're not making eye contact, it's because we can't see you. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a series of vignettes to provide a background as to how we came to look into the tumor microenvironment, specifically how it transitions in the metastatic process into uh, uh, um, things like kidneys and liver and uh, rather lungs and, and the heart. So just by way of disclosure, um, this talk is also linked with the RNA-based uh, vaccine um, that you heard a speaker uh, with last uh, yesterday. So uh, the first vignette I'm gonna talk about is, and I, I do need to uh, doff my cap to uh, Sloan Kettering because this work was done um, in melanoma back in the early 90s by Dr. Chapman, who identified that GD3 was a significant marker um, in melanoma. And we've subsequently gone on over the years and have shown with flow cytometry that it's there. It's a very unique antigen and it's unique for the reasons that the moment you go near it with any preservative decalcification, formalization, or whatever it is, it just disappears. And so you have to be, uh, make use of fresh frozen tissue, and this is an example of IHC. We've done this with GD2 now as well. And then we've been able to track the, the uh, GD3 synthase pathway, uh, which is ultimately the pathway that is triggered to produce these GD3s. Um, in, in, in cells that normally don't have them, like osteosarcoma, mangiosarcoma, mammary carcinoma, histiocytic carcinoma, and glioblastoma multiforme. And just by way of double checking our work, we've also done RNA scope on this uh, going forward. So just briefly, this vaccine, the GD3-based vaccine, is a liposome that's negatively charged, um, that's loaded with CPGs and GD3. And the liposome cell wall is made up of MPL, um, which triggers TLR9 and TLR4 interactions um, with uh, dendritic cells and resulting in the stimulation of INKT cells. Um, so we know that process because we've done this with it in mice and, and, and know how that works. What we're not too sure on is just exactly how these INKT cells uh, a, track to the tumor and also have the effect on the tumor. So going forward, that is some of the work um, that we're gonna look into. So in order to uh, elucidate the, the uh, mechanism of action of this vaccine, we made use of the syngenaic mouse model, the B16 syngenaic mouse model, and uh, this is an example of an experiment that we did where we had the vaccine group, uh, alpha gal which is the positive control for INKT cells and then a control group. And when we looked at these little mice's livers, um, what we found is that the GD3 produced significantly higher numbers of natural killer cells compared to the positive control. And then we compared it with the commercially available liposome, we also saw this, um, this difference. So fast tracking forward to the osteosarcoma trial, um, and all of this led up to 
uh, temporal sampling that we do with both melanoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma. And each time the animals visit us, we collect tissue. And then we also collect fresh frozen tissue at the time of surgery. And then um, depending on whether we're sampling maybe a, a superficial metastatic lesion or a necropsy, we're able to collect fresh frozen tissue there as well. So our phase one part of the trial uh, was where we combined um, surgery with six doses of carboplatin, four vaccines, and then the vaccine is given uh, two weeks post um, chemotherapy. Um, I haven't got the information yet to provide you with why that was the wo what we chose. There's, there's work that's been done before that's, that's shown that this is the optimum time. And then in the phase two part of the trial, we actually ended up giving six vaccines. Um, because we realized that in that first part of the trial, we were ending on chemo and not on, on the vaccine. So that's, that's providing a little bit of the background. And importantly, now we, uh, we're getting to the point where we've got amputation in the vaccine alone um, in this longitudinal study to get a sense of just what a role chemo played and what a role the vaccine alone in itself has played. And we've now got accrued 15 cases and they're maturing. So we'll know in the future where this goes. So this is a little bit of the survival data information for you. Oh, that's interesting. It's not a, it's missing a survival curve. Okay, well, we're not gonna, even if we wish it back, it's not gonna come back. Um, so what I wanted to just show you is we have a control group um, and then we have group one which got the four vaccines and then group two um, is, is the six vaccines and our median survival time is missing. Interesting. Okay, well, here it is back on this side. It looks like there's been a switch in the, the slide. So our median survival time for the um, six doses which is standard of care is 278 days and for group one and group two, it's uh, 389 and 319 days. And it is statistically significant. However, going forward, and this is the important part, and here's the survival curve, is that we only seem to make a difference for between 30 and 40% of dogs. And the question then is that even though we're giving all of this additional treatment, they not, the, the dogs that are failing are in the vaccine trial are failing at the same rate as the dogs getting standard of care. So we've been interested in coming up with, with possible ideas of what we can do there. One of them is protocol timing. The other one is the tumor microenvironment. And you can see where this story is going. It's taking us to um, this next part of the talk, which I'm coming to in a moment. But uh, we know that checkpoints of immunity play a role. We know there are epigenetic changes that are there. We know, and my graduate student will be publishing this soon, there are bacteria present intracellular within osteosarcoma and melanoma, so there is a tumor microbiome. And then the immune cells, which is the subject of our talk. What we do know as well is that the GD3, um, when, when there's a, a shift to the metastatic samples, that there's a shift from GD3 to GD2. So our new vaccine is a combination of these two. So going forward, uh, let me start with these two cases that we were able to get their primary tumors as well as their uh, um, metastatic tumors, um, although not as fresh frozen sections. So what we discovered when we uh, were investigating the histopathology with these cases is that there was this interface uh, between the cancer, which is here. So this is the tumor sitting over here and this is normal tissue on the outside and this is the actual kidney. And what we noticed is there were a lot of round cells sitting on the outside, and then there were clearly tumor cells, but the pathologist said to us, these look like macrophages, and I don't know how they know that, uh, because I couldn't really see it, so what we did is we decided to stain for them, and we stained with uh, two, uh, CD204, which is an, uh, um, a marker, uh, said to be a marker for M2 macrophages in osteosarcoma and I suddenly realize I have one minute. Is that right? Okay, <laughs> all right, so let's move on. <laughs> okay, so we did these staining, and this is what we got. So this is important for me to show you. This is CD3, and what we found is this is the tumor, this is the margin, and this is the kidney, and over here is the CD3 marking. 
And if we looked at CD20, which is a pan B cell marker, there were virtually no cells. But when we looked at macrophages, there were tons of them. And IBA, actually, macrophages were sitting in conjunction with these two cells, um, uh, with the, the CD3, and so with CD204. So what we did is we went in and we had a look. And I'm just going to show you the actual graphic of this, which is really easier to understand. So when we actually look at the CD3 and CD20s, they start off relatively high, but then when they get into the side of the, into the tumor, they're virtually zero, and this is the kidney. When we look at the macrophages, they are a reciprocal image of this, but they're all integrating with each other at higher concentrations at this margin, which leads me to think that there's a real inter, inter, um, interaction going on there. So um, this is the summary. And then in order to validate this, what we did is we um, took the Visium 10X platform that we've currently got 16 osteosarcomas with. This is the primary tumor. This is preliminary data. And we went through all of these markers. And the metastatic lesion is the one that's showing uh, quite a high mark in IBA. So it's corresponding to what we're seeing. Um, and importantly, when we looked at the monocytic series of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, we were seeing something similar. So in a nutshell, that is the summary, and I have to finish now because I've gone nine seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. When you're having fun, 10 minutes is very fast. So, Dr. Merlin? Um, so I'm Julia Medland, I'm a vet um, at the University of Minnesota, and I just, I know everyone said it, um, but I'm so grateful to be here. It's really inspiring and motivating, and I really hope to be back in the future. Um, um, I don't have anything to disclose, but um, the take-home messages I kind of wanted to give everyone are that we're running a clinical trial um, using VSV and Onyx together in dogs with metastatic and advanced osteosarcoma, um, that Onyx provides simultaneous inhibition of the CD47 myeloid checkpoint and the PD-1 exhaustion checkpoint, and that Onyx is well tolerated and has a potential efficacy signal in dogs with advanced cancer. Um, and so I don't really need to cover this more than it already has been, but osteosarcoma in people and dogs are convergent diseases, and um, that makes dogs a good model. They share a natural or a, a similar natural history and a similar tumor microenvironment and um, share that the major clinical problem is metastatic disease, even, even in the face of adequate local control. So there are um, many studies that, um, do that document the efficacy of immunotherapy in uh, primary canine osteosarcoma. Um, but there's less information about the efficacy of immunotherapy in the metastatic disease setting and some of that work is being done by people in this room. Um, and metastatic disease really presents the quality of life limiting issue for our patients. So understanding um, the role of immunotherapy in, in, the metastatic disease, in the metastatic setting is really crucial. Um, so um, the rationale for combining immunotherapies, um, I just kind of wanted to lay out, which is that we, we know from the group at the University of Florida that PDL1 is upregulated in the metastatic setting in osteosarcoma in dogs. Um, and so far, PD1 blockade has been ineffective um, uh, as a monotherapy in, in metastatic disease. And so um, we hope that combining therapies may help improve the efficacy of PD1 and PDL1 blockade. Um, and so the combination that we're trialing is VSV and Onyx. Onyx is a bifunctional molecule um, for PDL1 and um, CD47 blockade um, and is combined with an oncolytic uh, vesicular stomatitis virus or VSV. Um, and we're trialing this in dogs with metastatic and inoperable sarcomas, including osteosarcoma. Um, VSV has shown benefit in a subset of dogs with metastatic osteosarcoma. And there's preclinical evidence in mice um, for the efficacy and activity of CD47 blockade in osteosarcoma. We also have preclinical data showing that the combination is safe in mice. 
And so the primary endpoint of the study is really um, evidence of safety, um, but secondary endpoints are also evidence of efficacy in, in, in um, overall response rate and also immune modulation. We don't have primary tumors, so that will really be looking at, 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 at the peripheral immune cells. Um, so, in more detail, vesicular uh, VSV infects and kills tumor cells, and it releases virus and tumor-associated antigens, and promotes the recruitment of immune cells. Um, and VSV has a particularly high tropism for osteosarcoma cells. And so, um, then Onyx, the second component is bifunctional. It inhibits interactions between CD47 on tumor cells and SERP alpha on macrophages, dendritic cells, and um, other antigen-presenting cells. And this blockade enables antigen-presenting cells to engulf tumor cells and present tumor-associated antigens more efficiently. Um, Onyx also blocks the interaction between PD-1 on T cells and PD-L1 on tumor cells, macrophages, and other myeloid cells. Um, and PD-L1 um, is upregulated in in the metastatic disease setting in dogs. And so, um, uh, we're blocking PD-L1 from engaging PD-L1 and hopefully restoring the activity of T cells to be able to kill tumor cells. And so, now to go through those uh, actions a little bit more individually. Um, VSV infects tumor cells, um, then releases tumor antigens and also viral progeny, and both the tumor antigens and the viral progeny elicit a strong immune response, um, which results in the killing of uninfected tumor cells. Um, so next, CD47 inhibits, um, uh, in inhibiting CD47 triggers multiple aspects of innate anti-tumor immunity, and we found that uh, CD47 is consistently expressed in canine osteosarcoma, so this would seem to be a good, a good target for modulation. And so the effects of blockade are um, fast enhanced phagocytosis of tumor cells um, through elimination of the inhibitory signaling uh, that's mediated by SERP alpha on macrophages. Um, second, um, the enhancement of antigen presentation um, of phagocytosis of of phagocytose material, and in this situation, that's both tumor antigens and viral antigens. Um, third is antibody-dependent and complement-dependent cytotoxicity, which we don't see with Onyx because it doesn't have that FC re region of the antibody. Um, and fourth is the is really direct tumor apoptosis, um, as in where CD47 provides a survival signal to tumor cells. Um, and finally, uh, PDL1 and L2 are expressed on tumor cells and in cells in the tumor microenvironment, um, and PD1 is expressed in activated T cells, um, and both really rely on the immune response for their expression. Um, and generally, there's interferon gamma um, produced by um, uh, T cells and NK cells, um, and um, without that, neither PD-1 or PD-L1 is expressed. So when PD-L1 engages PD-1, it shuts down multiple aspects of T cell signaling and creates really an exhausted state. Um, and blocking that interaction reawakens the T cells and allows um, it, them, them to resume their job of, of, of killing tumor cells. Um, and again, we know that PD-L1 is preserved in the metastatic setting in dogs and that PD-1 blockade alone is, is, is ineffective. So our bifunctional molecule Onyx binds both CD47 uh, and PDL1, um, and so here you can see um, that CD47 is attached to the surface, and that we then add Onyx, which is this guy, um, 90 seconds later, and then uh, five minutes later we add PDL1, um, and you can see here that that that, that binding um, we bind. Uh, CD47 and Onyx, and that's quite stable. We don't really see much dissociation. And then uh, when we add PDL1, it continues to be stable again, um, and 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 both remain bound to to Onyx. Um, so um, Onyx is also stable in vivo in mice, um, and has a half life of more than 50 hours, and 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 displaces CD47 and anti PDL1 antibodies in human, mouse, and and dog tumor cells. Um, so that moves us to our clinical trial. Um, 
uh, and this is Poppy. She's an almost two-year-old female spayed Lupicati spaniel. She was diagnosed with osteosarcoma of the left distal femur. Um, she failed standard of care therapy, which in dogs is amputation, followed by carboplatin. She was then given doxorubicin as a rescue chemotherapy and unfortunately progressed again prior to being enrolled in the meteor trial. Um, and so you can see Poppy's lesion here, and if you can't, I put a circle around it. Um, it's on her left distal femur, and then you can also see um, from this still image of her um, thoracic CT, her multiple pulmonary nodules. Um, and this may not work. Oh, there it goes. Um, so she, this is a um, just kind of running loop of her thorax CT. You can see kind of her multiple um, her multiple pulmonary nodules, kind of showing how widespread her disease is. Um, she was then treated with VSV and Onyx. She received two doses intravenously of Onyx, uh, sorry, of, uh, of, of, of VSV on day one and two, and then that was well tolerated. She then went on to receive subcutaneous Onyx on days three, five, and eight, um, resulted in very mild grade one gastrointestinal adverse effects, mainly inappetence and vomiting, and we were able to, to manage that medically. Um, she unfortunately then had disease progression and was humanely euthanized on day 47 after beginning the trial. So from this one case, um, this drug combination appears to be safe. Um, it, she, she had relatively mild and tolerable side effects um, and survived five weeks after um, initial progression of her metastatic disease, which is really within the possibility of benefit um, given that many dogs progress much more rapidly than this. Uh, but obviously we need additional data um, to establish efficacy. So this is an ongoing study. Uh, it's open and enrolling additional subjects. We've screened 29 dogs so far. Um, we'll uh, move on to then to, to correlative studies that include PKD, uh, PK and PD um, and mechanism of action and um, positive signals will provide justification for a larger trial and discussions on how this approach could be moved into the setting of a pediatric trial. Um, so again, my kind of main points are that I would, that we're running a clinical trial using VSV and Onyx together in dogs with metastatic and advanced osteosarcoma that Onyx provides simultaneous inhibition of the CD47 myeloid checkpoint and the PD-1 exhaustion checkpoint, and that Onyx is well tolerated and has a potential efficacy signal in dogs with advanced cancer. And so there are lots of people that have helped with the study. Um, I don't really have time to acknowledge them, but Jaime Modiano is really the brains behind this, and his lab has been instrumental in this, so um, we'll take questions, I guess, after this panel. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia. Brian? Very good afternoon. I'm sorry that large lunch is starting to settle in, but I'll stay awake, so hopefully you will. Um, so I'm pleased to present today. What a, a grand meeting, right? It's been a privilege to be here and plan to come each subsequent year. Um, this is the first time we've presented kind of publicly this, this work we've been doing at Johns Hopkins, um, looking at a stimulator of interferon gamma genes, that's STING is its acronym, and its effects injecting it into canine osteosarcoma. So I certainly have not done all this work. Our collaborators, so Dr. Dara Kreitschman is a vet uh, interventional radiologist, and she's co-PI on the grant with me, and she treats the dogs, right? She's given the treatments. We have our pathology team who's been uh, key to Right, acquire the samples and help us process them, Dr. Corey Brayton and one of our excellent residents, Sarah Powers. And then my lab, we've done all the kind of correlative analysis work and especially highlight Michelle Dossé as our senior research tech who's put together a lot of this data. So my goal, right, our goal in, in immunotherapy to me would be to generate a potent anti-tumor immune response capable of eradicating, eradicating metastatic osteosarcoma and protecting against future relapse. And I personally see that would include activation of both T cells as well as B cells and their memory capabilities. I was thinking maybe I just put the abscopal effect right in, in larger terms, right? But that's, that would be my goal. So in osteosarcoma, this is a big challenge to overcome. So here's a slide of osteosarcoma, similar to Dr. Milner, right? We've then stained this for T cells. So T cells are here in brown. And you can see 
almost none, right? Just devoid of T cells. Maybe they're wandering around. I don't know what they're doing, right? But just very few. So it's, right, this is a large bar to take a tumor that looks like this and generate a potent T cell, you know, response to these tumors. But these tumors are not ignored by the immune system. Similar, right, as Dr. Milner showed, here's a stain of macrophage monocytes in an osteosarcoma sample. Right, so these tumors are just filled with these immune cells. So our hypothesis was, can we use these immune cells that are present, perhaps tumor intrinsic signaling, to potentially spark an immune response, right, and get some of the T cells and B cells involved. So we wanted to investigate this using the STING pathway. So the STING pathway is a cell intrinsic danger sensing pathway. It can be activated by both DNA damage, right, causing double strand DNA breaks, viral infection. But what it does is these cells sense these damages that have occurred, will then turn on transcription factors that turn on inflammatory cytokines uh, such as interferon beta, TNF, right, and um, this isn't just immune cells, but other cells in the body have the same pathway. So one of our first questions was, is this pathway you know, present in osteosarcoma. We've looked at the human uh, osteosarcoma uh, target, right, RNA-seq data set, and looked for kind of each component of this pathway. So cell surface receptors, the, or the sensors, the signaling pathways, as well as transcription factors, they're all present in these tumors, right, in this expression data. In canine osteosarcoma, right, so this is some published RNA-seq data um, gleaned to look at sting expression, though variable, right, it is present in many of these tumors. So, of course, this RNA-seq, right, you're taking whole tumor out and sending it for RNA sequencing, it's a mixture of cells there, right, tumor cells, immune cells, other cells that are present. Dr. Young is going to talk next much more about the sting pathway in the tumor cells themselves. But, right, we wanted to see can we activate this pathway in dogs. So first looking at canine, these are dendritic cells that we derive from peripheral blood. We see expression of kind of all the required pathway members. But interestingly, we had a canine osteosarcoma line, and when we looked there, right, we had no expression of C-gas, a key sensor, as well as sting, which is one of the main signal transduction pathways, right? So in this cell line, there was nothing there. So when we treated with the sting agonist, the agonist we've used is ADUS100, as started by Aduro Biotech, was the company that started this uh, compound. And we looked for induction of the sting pathway, looking at the downstream cytokines. So TNF, interferon beta, as well as uh, interferon response element, IFIT1. So we look at peripheral blood or the dendritic cells that we derive and treat them with sting agonists. We see significant induction of the sting pathway. But, right, you might say, not surprisingly, when we treat that osteosarcoma line, we don't see any induction of this pathway. So, right, so we have a tumor where we know this pathway is present. What cells are contributing to it is what we, right, what we'll discover as we go on. But so we started with a sting agonist into canine osteosarcoma, the clinical trial. We're enrolling dogs with non-metastatic osteosarcoma. Importantly, the sting agonist is given via intratumoral injection. So this is Dr. Kreitschman, what she does. And the image guided, you're in the tumor, we know we're injecting it right into the tumor. Importantly, we also know exactly where we injected it and that we'll compare in the future kind of where we injected that sting agonist versus parts of the tumor that are distant from that. So this is part of a, a trial, right, that we're running the next arm, we're going to start combining with cryotherapy. Right, that's a story to be determined. But our schedule, we treat with sting one week, the next week a second dose, the following week the dogs are amputated. So this is a great benefit to have kind of this window design where we then get the amputated tumor to be able to see the effects of this therapy. So importantly, I'm not asking this sting agonist to go in and shrink this tumor. Right, that's not the goal. Can we just spark an immune response? And that amputation is what's going to take care of that tumor. And importantly, when we look at the data, right, this is now a week after sting agonist treatment. So most of the effects we see are not the immediate sting pathway, but more the downstream you know, secondary effects from sting. So our initial analysis of the amputated tumors has included IHC as well as RNA uh, expression, it will show you. So this is what an untreated tumor looks like or an area of the tumor that's distant from where we inject the sting. So looking at B cells, T cells, myeloid cell marker IBA1, see again a preponderance of myeloid cells but very few T cells, very few B cells present. Whereas in the sites where we've injected with sting, 
Right? We see really a robust T cell infiltrate here in the second row. We see an increased number of B cells present in these tumors. And similar to what Dr. Milner has shown, almost a compensatory increase in the myeloid compartment as well. But really a significant increase in T cells that we don't see um, you know, pre-treatment. So we've treated 10 dogs, done IHC analysis of these, and importantly, every dog is not responding equally. There's a lot of variation. And so here we have kind of pre-sting or distant sting sites versus the treated area, looking at the change in T-cell infiltrates. Um, on the left is absolute number, on the right is kind of the ratio of pre and post-treatment. So even though it's variation, right, eight of 10 dogs, we saw greater than two-fold induction. So how does it affect the myeloid cells that are often already present in these tumors? See, it's much more variable. Some tumors, we do see an increase in the myeloid population. Others, kind of no change. We've focused one thing on the T-cell to myeloid cell ratio, that it's thought the more T-cells to myeloid cells you have, perhaps it's more of a productive T-cell response. And you see in several of the dogs, right, we're able to get to almost a one-to-one T-cell to myeloid cell ratio in these areas of the tumor. B cells look similar to T cells, like if, and uh, so the dogs where we saw a significant increase, we also saw with, with B cells as well. Again, with eight of 10 dogs having greater than two-fold induction. So with dogs, we're very limited in some of the phenotyping we can do on antibody uh, availability and such. So we wanted to do some RNA uh, expression analysis using the nanostring path or package that some have talked about. So we did specific coring of the tissues in that we compared the sites that were not infiltrated versus areas that we knew were infiltrated in the tumor, isolated RNA, sent it, um, and did our uh, nanostring analysis. So importantly, the nanostring was somewhat similar to our IHC analysis, that again, the dogs where we saw an increase in T cells on the IHC, we also saw an increased T cell signal in the nanostring uh, data. And I'll show, um, and just focus on two of the dogs where we saw the most pronounced response. So looking at the sting treated areas versus the untreated areas, 190 genes showed differential gene expression. Nanostring will then let you look at pathway type analysis of their data. And the uh, pathways that were most significantly upregulated include antigen processing, B cell functioning, co-stimulatory functions, T cell cytotoxicity. So really right, evidence that potentially we are sparking you know, a nice immune response going on in these tumors. I don't think sting agonist, right, it's not the, the cure, right, but is it inducing something that we then can take advantage of, right? So one thing I'm specifically interested in, what are our potential inhibitory pathways that are upregulated with this treatment? So here looking at expression of targetable markers, so PD-L1, PD-1, right, other co-stimulatory molecules, ID-01, as well as TGF-beta, right, so we see in, Right in the dogs where we saw the best treatment response, we also saw up regulation of these costum or the sorry checkpoint inhibitor uh, pathways as well. So again, just back to our goal, right? Can we generate this potent immune response that can protect right this dog after amputation, right? Protect them in the future, to be determined. But I do think we are accomplishing, right? We are sparking some immune response going on in these tumors. So just a conclusion, right, we see that the sting pathway seems operable in osteosarcoma. Is it the tumor cells versus immune cells, right? This is a key question that's important. And um, as I said, Dr. Young is gonna talk more about that. The, but we can, right, in some of these animals, induce a significant T cell and B cell response in these tumors. But it also and, um, you know, brings up the question, what will be other combination therapies that will work well with the sting agonist that we can potentially make this immune response even more potent? So thanks again to those who've done the work and our funding uh, agencies, as well as our, our participants. So. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Yao? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to MIB agents, uh, especially Christina, um, for the opportunity to share my research today on the sting pathway in osteosarcoma. And I also wanted to say thank you to um, the family fund of uh, the Murdoffs. Um, and I'm here uh, today because of Charlotte. So I'm a pediatric oncologist and physician scientist at UCSF in the Sweet Cordera Lab. 
um, here uh, with a strong contingency of other uh, women scientists this year. Um, and I specifically am focused on um, basically tumor intrinsic immunomodulatory mechanisms in osteosarcoma. And So you did hear uh, quite a bit about this pathway already, but I do want to highlight that over the past couple of years, the CGAS sting pathway really has emerged as an important target in um, immuno-oncology. This pathway encapsulates uh, a dominant mechanism by which cells respond to foreign DNA in the cytoplasm, whether that's due to viral infection in healthy cells or chromosomal instability in tumor cells like osteosarcoma. And um, the presence of DNA in the cytoplasm ignites um, a signaling cascade through the DNA sensor CGAS, um, through sting, and downstream effectors including TBK1 and IRF3, resulting in interferon-stimulated uh, gene transcription um, mediated by interferon beta. And um, ultimately, what this has been shown now through, through years and years of literature is really to activate the immune system um, in infection and in a tumor context. Um, and really particularly here, I wanted to highlight, um, it's been brought up in this conference the past few days, the importance of studying metastasis. And so there is actually recent um, emerging literature about the importance of sting repression actually in mediating uh, dormancy and uh, emergence um, from a period of dormancy in distant metastatic sites. So we became really interested in this pathway because of this really unique feature that osteosarcoma possesses, um, the chromosomal instability that's seen sort of invariably across the um, disease. And um, this really should, uh, as has, has been pointed out, serve as sort of an input to the sting pathway and should serve as a, a kind of a pro-immune um, activation signal, but certainly does not. So when we profiled our panel of 11 osteosarcoma patient-derived xenograft-derived cell lines, or PDX cell lines, um, we actually noticed the presence of micronuclei, which are cytoplasmic foci of double-stranded DNA that have been ejected from the nucleus. We saw these um, across the entire panel at uh, varying burdens, shown here on the panel on the right. So these initial observations led us to the hypothesis that there's an anti-oncogenic inflammatory signal via CGAS sting that is dampened in osteosarcoma to avoid immune destruction. And by elucidating the mechanism of this dysregulation of the pathway, we hope to um, identify novel avenues to activate immune um, stimulation in osteosarcoma. So in this model shown here, if we can restore the function of CGAS sting in the tumor cell, we're really um, opening sort of the harnessing of a tumor intrinsic uh, pathway that can actually uh, remodel the tumor microenvironment. So we started out with two key questions. First of all, is the CGAS sting pathway actually functional or disrupted in uh, human osteosarcoma? And second of all, does increasing sting activation help overcome immune evasion? So to evaluate the function of this pathway in osteosarcoma, we first looked to our panel of PDX cell lines together with the commercial lines, and just looked um, by Western blotting at CGAS and sting levels. And so we observed, as you can see here with these variable intensity um, uh, blot, um, shapes on this blot, um, there's really a subgroup of cell lines that have very low CGAS and a subgroup of cell lines that have very low sting. And there's actually not much overlap um, between the two, meaning uh, we, we you can see an it, a, apparent inverse relationship between CGAS levels and sting levels across these lines. So then we really sought to determine whether there was some functional implication of the difference in uh, protein levels that we observed. So we tested our PDX cell lines with a sting agonist. We used diabsy here. And we observed comparing the panel on the far left, OS052, which has higher sting levels, it actually has re uh, retained capacity to actually activate sting in response to a sting agonist, as shown by phosphorylation of TBK1. Uh, STAT1 as well, compared to the two panels uh, more towards the right, where you really see lower sting levels and an absence of an induction of sting. And this sort of differential uh, activation capacity cascaded further downstream uh, in terms of interferon-stimulated gene expression 
in so far as uh, that we saw really um, market up, um, up uh, increase in expression of ISGs in the sting high cell line OS052, but really no induction in the sting low lines. So we brought in this analysis to the entire cell line panel that I showed earlier, and we emerged with sort of two groupings of sting activation capacity. And these did generally correlate with the sting protein levels that I showed um, to begin. So then we sought to look sort of even further upstream from sting itself to sea gas and, and um, wanted to determine if sea gas activity was actually shaping um, the, the kind of differences we were seeing in sting activation capacity and sting levels. So we looked at sea gas staining by immunofluorescence shown on the right panel here, and we saw marked variability in sea gas recruitment to micronuclei in our osteo cell line panel. So then when we sort of um, created an overall metric of sea gas activity, which is depicted here in this plot, and then overlaid the sting activation capacity groupings from prior, we really um, sort of now jumps out that there's these two groups, um, and there really does seem to be sort of a re relationship between sea gas activity and sting repression. So the bar plots in pink, including the one that um, you can't even see at the far right, 833, are lines that have higher sting levels and have um, actually no or very low sea gas uh, recruitment to micronuclei. And then conversely, the lines in purple have uh, very high chromosomal instability, high levels of micronuclei with sea gas recruitment and have really repressed sting. So then we wanted to directly probe the role of sea gas activation on sting repression. So we treated our five sting low cell lines with a sea gas inhibitor and actually saw that this did seem to release the repression of sting levels. Um, and sting levels went up in all five of these cell lines, as shown most clearly on the bottom right in the quantification of this Western blot. So we actually hypothesized that really putting all this all together, what's going on here is that there's kind of a chronic sea gas activation in these uh, chromosomal um, chromosomally unstable cell lines that's actually begetting sting repression through perhaps a um, trafficking-mediated degradation mechanism and um, really resulting in an insensitivity to sting agonism. And I think this is really important not only because we are now looking at ways to reverse this repression of sting levels due to sea gas activation, but also because um, I think in the translation of sting agonists and some of the um, you know, less than optimal prior attempts at translating um, targeting of this pathway, um, we acknowledge that uh, sting activation is known to be transient, and that's actually built in to avoid autoinflammation in healthy cells. So really understanding the mechanisms of sting degradation is gonna be pivotal as we work towards translating immune um, inflammatory uh, targeting in the future. And so uh, lastly, um, I'll show just a couple slides on sort of a parallel effort um, to utilize RNA-seq to actually define for the first time a osteosarcoma-specific sting activation signature. We uh, used our, our groupings from prior on the sting activation capacity and treated these cell lines with a sting agonist. We first showed in an unbiased manner that um, the cell lines that we had suspected from prior were that were um, insensitive, insensitive to sting agonism truly were. We didn't see any sort of um, expression changes in this unbiased approach. And then we also took the sting high cell lines from prior and stimulated with diabsy, and then really were able to define, as shown here in this volcano plot, um, what are the specific changes in this tumor intrinsic pathway in osteosarcoma? And there is some overlap with other um, studies in different cellular contexts, but we have uh, highlighted some of the unique features here. So then once we had identified this sting on signature, we used single sample GSEA to look at our patient data and saw that really only a very small subset of patient samples have um, high enrichment of this sting on inflammatory signature. And so correlative analyses with this are ongoing as well as expanding to larger data sets. So in summary, I have some of the key points here, but what I really just wanted to highlight is I think what this is is a foundation of kind of the building blocks of really what is going on with the sea gas sting pathway in osteosarcoma, which I think is really an important sort of um, 
uh, body of, of knowledge to establish as we, we try to understand the connection between chromosomal instability and innate immunity and, and really understanding the mechanisms that are at play here as we're working on translating um, therapies forward. So thank you all uh, for your time, and I also wanted to just uh, thank my mentor Alejandro specifically, um, as well as Battle Osteosarcoma and St. Baldrick's Foundation for really empowering me to build a research program in immuno-oncology immuno at UCSF. Thank you. I want to thank the first four speakers, fantastic uh, presentations, and I already see a question here in the audience on my left. Uh, we're going to start here in the, just to your left. Yeah, thanks to all the speakers. Those were really amazing talks. Um, so amazing that I have like hundreds of questions. So I'm going to stick to two really quick ones if I can. One uh, for Rowan. And so when, when you showed the data of the GD3 uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier, it really resembles uh, what we've seen with a lot of other immunotherapies. And we have a, a preprint in BioArchive right now from the Vigor trial with VSV showing essentially the same thing. And the tail is all the dogs that had a pre-existing um, CD8 immune population in the tumor. So I don't know if you've looked um, at, the, at the tumor a priori before you vaccinated to look at that. And let me um, put a question to Brian really quickly. Brian, you can think about this while Rowan answers. <laughs> so um, we, um, we had seen some similar data in, in sort of these neoadjuvant intratumoral uh, efforts before, and so um, one of the things we, we did in, in Vigor, even though it was not an intratumoral um, uh, therapy, was to actually look at placebo-treated dogs in the new adjuvant setting and look at uh, tumor inflammation. And we see that because we are biopsying the dogs when they come in to get eligibility, we see a biopsy effect. And so the question was whether when you and Dara had done the uh, intratumoral infusion whether you ever did a placebo where you did the whole process of the IR and poked the bone but didn't inject um, the agonist to see if you got the same inflammation. So, Dr. Mel. So, um, to answer your first question, I think that's Jaime, right? I can't see your face from here. Um, so, what we plan to do with those samples that I showed you and, and a couple of others, we'll use nanostring to evaluate that uh, because it's in FFPE. Um, but what we uh, have seen in the um, uh, 10x genomics platform is that you are limited by the size of the fiducial. It's only six millimeters by six millimeters. And so, to get that junction between um, you know, that, that, that range that you have at the uh, level of the tumor and then the margin and, and so on is not that easy. So um, the data that we have on that in terms of the CD8 signal is that it's minimal in um, primary osteosarcomas and in the metastatic lesions at this stage. We haven't yet, uh, um, so we've got to, uh, that's actually my graduate student's project for this week, is to separate <laughs> out her data, um, and she's busy with it, so it's Alea Ackerman, and uh, um, I'm really pleased that I, uh, that I met Troy here today because he helped us a lot with some information on the analysis. 10X does require um, a lot of additional work, and so we, the annotation of the, the markers for the different immune cells um, is a little more tricky, and, and we need to make sure we're doing the right thing there. Brian? Okay. Thanks. Brian? Yeah, thanks. The, um, right, the placebo effect, or right, just the, in, um, right, where you're putting the needle. So we, we haven't done placebo. Uh, I mean, as, I mean, these are not quite experimental animals, right? These are pet animals, so we haven't, uh, you know, I guess we could, we could consider, you know, for instance, just poking another area of the tumor just and just leave that. And that's something we can discuss. We're, um, and that's one thing that we've that we've tried to right that we're working on getting is more just completely untreated tumors and uh, right for the NIH and from their repository just so we can have a better, um, you know, baseline. And that it the effect that we do see it is localized, right? And that and that to me is right both important worrisome, right, but it's, it really is just where we inject, and we don't inject very much, it's like a 100 microliter injection, um, but 
right, the inflammation and the, especially the T cell infiltrates and things is really localized to where that in injection occurs. So, right, as review of our paper in the future, I think that's an important question we need to address. So, thank you, Brian. Thank you. I'll, I'll review the yeah, that's we, we have a question. No, please don't. No. <laughs> uh, our next question is up front here on the left. Bruce Smith, Auburn. Um, I apologize because I'm going to ask you to speculate, and the answers probably will be better after a few adult beverages. But in the greater scheme of the treatment pathway, both in dogs where we amputate first and then treat with chemotherapy, and in human patients where we reverse that, what is your thought on the necessary tumor burden to induce or spark, pardon the pun, uh, an immune response and the impact of chemotherapy on the potential of sparking an immune response? Panels. So if I, I'll take that one. So some of the, right, so being a pediatric oncologist, I'm used to that neoadjuvant treatment paradigm. And um, so I hope the vets think it's, it's ethical that we've been doing kind of a window study, right, and doing it before. That has been a downside, right? Some families, they just want the tumor amputated. They don't want to wait for us to do their thing. Um, but so, so I, in that our, my hope is that we're using the tumor as somewhat of an in situ vaccine. So I don't know what the antigens are, and especially in osteosarcoma, I think everyone's are gonna be different. So I do think having that tumor burden present up front can be an important part of that. Um, some of our most exciting data that we're just starting to get in on, it's hard to you know, say it, but, but when we combine, so we've done this in the mice now in several models, when we combine carboplatin and sting agonist, we're actually seeing much better responses than either alone. And so for instance, in this trial platform, I'm interested, would be something we can certainly apply where we give a dog, you know, give them a dose of carbo with the sting beforehand and see what kind of effect. And that um, my hope, and one reason I like osteosarcoma and want to pursue osteosarcoma is I think this model fits well with that disease where you know, you treat, then you take the tumor out, um, you're using chemo that potentially can be immune activating, um, and so we'll see where things go there. Going back a, a couple of years, um, we were doing the uh, cytotoxic T assay uh, for melanomas, and we were using the uh, canine uh, CTAC cells, canine thyroid adenocarcinoma cells, and at one stage we, we lost a batch of them, and um, we happened to have some osteosarcoma cells that uh, were matched to a patient. So we had the PBMCs from the dog, and we had its osteosarcoma. And we mixed those two to do the natural killer assay. And I can't remember what our logic was, but we saw killing as strong as you would get with a positive control. And we then subsequently repeated this, and it's always dwelled in my mind that inherently, it seems that osteosarcoma cells can trigger an immune reaction in the body that can kill it. It's just being thwarted. And, and what is that process? And so, you know, I think that's something that's there. One Our final question. question back right. Thanks. I have a, a general, sort of general question for um, maybe Brian and, and Rowan about immune fitness. Um, so, you know, Whenever we look at a number of different immunotherapies, there always seems to be a percentage of individuals that, that seem to respond. And so um, are either of you um, looking at thinking about the basic immune fitness of the patient prior to uh, treatment with immunotherapy? And uh, if, if you are, what sort of tests would you be considering doing to assess the immune fitness of the patient to either potentially predict response to immunotherapy or stratify the patient uh, for immunotherapy? We'll ask for a very brief answer. Um, so you bring up a really interesting point and it was the concern that we had with the osteosarcoma vaccine trial because we were giving it with chemotherapy and were we gonna blow the dog's immune system out of the water with the chemo and they wouldn't react? But researchers in Holland actually showed um, that you could give chemo and the immune cells, the cytotoxic T cells and so on, were less affected by chemo um, than, than we thought. And, and it seems to be borne out in what we see with the osteosarcoma trial. With the melanoma trial back uh, 15 years ago when we began it, we were doing, um, much to my uh, biosize hatred of it, 
We were doing cytotoxic T cell assays on all the dogs, going into the trial and then following on. And we couldn't really show which dogs were going to um, respond to the vaccine or not, but what we did see is those dogs that were not killing the positive control on the cytotoxic T assay, they were dismal. They failed really quickly and died like flies, it's, it's sadly to say. And, and so clearly, you know, to answer your question, does the patient have to be in an immune fit state? And they, I, I would say so, yes. The, um, so I'm sure no one could pay attention right to my slides, but the, the dogs that had the greatest T cell bump were the ones that had a good baseline to begin with. <laughs> And, right, so Amy LeBlanc's data yesterday, right, conferences like this are great because then you have to try and put your story in with everybody else's story and try and figure it out. But, you know, so there are different kind of immune phenotypes of these tumors that will make them more apropos to respond to this. Um, I think it's nice in dogs that you can start with a immune system that hasn't had chemo, right? It's certainly, that's certainly one of my worries in treating patients and, you know, immune therapy trials in patients where, you know, they just got off eight cycles of ifosfamide, and for some reason the immune therapy doesn't work. Um, so, but it's, yeah, I think, and one thing we're trying to do, and if anyone has a great T cell assay, I'd love to, it seems like dogs are all about antibodies, I'd love to, does someone have a positive control T cell assay that we can use, just to start to look at, like, is there any tumor specificity to these T cells, and can we follow those? And uh, right, can we generate any you know, true tumor-specific immune response? So, so Julia and Bet Betsy are not going to get off the stage without being asked the question. So I'm going to ask maybe well, I, I actually had a brief comment on that. You have a, okay, okay, good. Back on it. Thank you. I do think, um, no, it's a great question. And I guess um, just, just to, again, make a plug for what's going on in the tumor that's contributing to how the immune microenvironment is shaped if we're using sort of um, agents that are actually working through a mechanism of action that is vastly heterogeneous in the tumor itself, I think keeping that, uh, bringing that in in correlative studies and um, in sort of all of the powerful analyses that are ongoing with a lot of this translational work to sort of figure out why the non-responders don't respond, I think looking there, particularly in the realm of, of sting agonists and, and paying attention to sort of what we're seeing emerge out of, out of my work that there seems to be sting disruption and CGAS disruption in a subset of tumors, and that may be a determinant of the response uh, rates that we see. Julia, in your experiment that you mentioned about VSV, um, I noticed that your protocol has both, you're mixing both IV injections and sub-Q sort of follow-on injections. Is, is there any difference between how the routes of administration results in different kind of reactions do you have? This is the first time we've given onyx um, to dogs and we've given it sub-Q. And I mean, Vigo, we've previously given IV to dogs and that's been well tolerated. And I don't know if the, the effects that we saw in onyx were different because they were given subcutaneously or I'm not really sure. Maybe Jaime can speak to that a little bit better since he's had more experience with VSV, but. That's great. Uh, and Betsy, one, one last question and we'll go on, sorry. Yeah. Um, so in, in your uh, chronic uh, CGAS activated uh, down regulation of sting, is that suppression a, on, a, on a protein level post-translationally, or is it transcriptional regulation or epigenetics that you yeah, can potentially take care of it? Yeah, thank you. I actually meant to mention that. Um, it seems to be a post-transcriptional uh, post effect, probably through sort of lysosomal trafficking, um, is what we're seeing in some of the, the work I've been doing the last few weeks that didn't make it into my slides. And there's no transcriptional effect that we see. So there are uh, plenty of op opportunity to ask them more questions, but I think the panel first, have panels for their uh, terrific talks and all the Q and A's. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to invite uh, the next three speakers to come up. Change of guards here. And Tanella will be the first speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm very grateful um, as I have the opportunity to share our work about uh, INKT as an overcellular therapy for osteosarcoma. Why INKT? Two main reasons. So first of all, they can attack osteosarcoma through uh, two pathways, from two angles. 
uh, and this is because INKTs express a semi-invariant T cell receptor that recognizes CD1D. This is a very special MHC molecule, it's a non-polymorphic molecule presenting glycolipids such as alpha galactosylceramide. And as you can see, it can be found on both the cancer cells, osteosarcoma cells, but also tumor-associated macrophages. So I and KT can very effectively kill both components in osteosarcoma, and at the same time can also activate other killer cells, natural killer T cells, that can find now their way to cancer cells to potentiate the anti-tumor activity of INKTs. And finally, we can engineer INKT cells to express a chimeric antigen receptor, which is a synthetic protein that can very specifically recognize molecules on osteosarcoma cells and therefore kill even more effectively cancer cells. So we have now a potentially beautiful cellular platform that can be used to kill and eradicate osteosarcomas through two different pathways simultaneously the inherent T cell receptor, and the chimeric antigen receptor. And the second important point is that INKT compared to conventional MHC-restricted T cells do not cause graft versus host disease. So that means that we can take them from healthy donors, expand them in the lab, and give to any patients without uh, inducing disruption of healthy tissue. Actually, INKT can protect normal tissues, but at the same time, they can kill very effectively any transformed cells. And as you can see here, there are now ongoing trials where donor INKT cells have been used to treat patients with B cell malignancies, solid tumors, as well as severe infectious disease like COVID 19 and flu, uh, like associated uh, respiratory distress syndrome. What is amazing here is that without requiring any chemotherapy before and without requiring the gene editing that we would expect in conventional T-cell therapies, INKTs can even induce complete remissions in patients that otherwise would be without any therapeutic option. So a question that is still to be answered though is, how can these cells remain in their recipients? How long could they persist and therefore ensure a long and extended therapeutic activity? To answer the que this question, we started a, a comparative approach. We've been using, obviously, uh, canine patients as the opportunity to implement and optimize our cellular therapy so we can then offer the best car immunotherapy approach to our patients. And this has been a very successful approach. Of course, we've already seen it for the establishment of allogenic transplant in humans. And the reason why we are very keen to use this now in osteosarcoma patients, as we said, is that uh, canine and human patients are very similar in their immune system, in their spontaneous tumor, and they receive also very similar clinical management. So the best setting to answer our question about INKT immunotherapy. We started these studies where no one really knew whether INKT are functional in dogs. And what we found is that very surprisingly, INKT in dogs and humans are almost identical in that, for example, they have an almost identical T cell receptor, which is the unique biological feature of INKTs. And therefore, we can use human reagents to track these cells in dogs, isolate them, and expand to generate our cellular therapy. If we look at their phenotype, you can see how remarkably similar canine and human INKTs are, whereas the murine cells, for example, lack the CDA positive subset, which is key to induce effective cytotoxic activity in the patients. And if we go deeper, at a single cell level also, we found a similar subset characterized both the canine and the human INKTs. And of course, if you compare INKTs with T cells or NK cells, you can see that the subsets are not matching. So obviously, the biology behind these cells is very unique. If we expand them, they have an excellent expandability. We can expand them up to one billion times uh, fold 
uh, in a clinically relevant, uh, relevant time. And if we engineer them, of course, we can engineer them very effectively, and you see how more powerful they are compared to an edited INKT in their ability to kill osteosarcoma. So next question for us was, how can we now identify the optimal donor, the best donor, so we can give any patient the optimal current KT product for maximal therapeutic activity. So we started some single cell RNA seq analysis to identify biomarkers of function in INKTs. And we found that donors with uh, enrichment in central memory markers, low exhaustion markers, and high levels of telomerase associated genes are also those cells which are capable of killing osteosarcoma cells at uh, the highest level. So we took these cells from donor three particularly, and we started a pilot mm, study in two research dogs. So we took 400 million cells from donor three, a female dog, we infused them in two 30 kilo dogs, so pediatric size, uh, with the idea that the sex mismatch would give us the opportunity to ask that important question about persistence. How long the donor cells from that female dog persist in our recipient dogs? And we did it by monitoring expression of a female associated gene exist. We used a very low toxic approach by uh, treating the recipients first with very low dose cyclophosphamide compared to what we would do in normal cellular therapies. And we also combined INKT with alpha-galatosyl ceramide, which is a lipid that is able to activate uh, INKT cells in vitro with the idea of also potentiate them in vivo. And what we found is that the combination was very well tolerated. No graft versus host disease, even if we use 400 million cells from a non-related dog. The host immune system was activated with uh, particularly increased levels and activation of cytotoxic cells, but most importantly, we found a persistence for up to nearly three months, which is something that has never been observed so far using conventional approaches in both preclinical models, mice, but also human patients. So this is, of course, for us the foundation for the next step, which is a canine trial using current KT in K9 osteosarcoma patients. The idea is that we really believe this could be a key for us to produce uh, cellular therapies which are less toxic, probably cheaper compared to conventional approaches, and could broaden the accessibility of these cellular therapies to a broader patient population. And also, we really hope to see improved clinical outcomes because we're using cells from healthy donors, because we expect these cells to persist and therefore produce durable therapeutic activity. But also, we believe these are amenable to com combination with other approaches. I told you about alpha galatosyl ceramide, but also possibly other cellular therapies because INKT can really orchestrate the immune system and cooperate with other cells, including NK cells and T cells. And with this, I would like to thank you all for the attention. Obviously, I would like to thank my mentor, Nicola Mason, uh, all people in the veterinary school and the medical school at Penn that collaborated with us, Fred Hutchinson for the profiling of our uh, donors, and of course, all of you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any question. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I would like to thank Christina and, and other organizers for uh, giving me an opportunity to come here, inviting me here to speak. And I would like to thank the family of uh, Ryan Tobin for the travel award. And I would like to express my admiration for patients and their families. You are strong and brave. God bless you. So um, I would like to talk about um, radium immunotherapy of uh, osteosarcoma. And um, I actually was talking about it at uh, 2022 um, uh, factor, right before the pandemic. So I will show you where we were at that point and uh, where we are now. Um, 
through those three years. So, but first I would like to give a short introduction about uh, what is the targeted radionuclide therapy because it hasn't been talked about uh, today yet. So it's a very simple concept. Basically, you have a molecule which targets cytosidal radiation uh, to the site of the tumor. And by cytosidal radiation, I mean radioactive isotopes which decay and they emit particles, alpha particles or beta particles. Those particles are highly energetic. They moved at the relativistic speed which is higher than speed of light. And they can do a lot of damage to DNA, cellular machinery, uh, and so on. So there are some recent approvals in that area. For example, uh, lutetium labeled peptide, lutatera, it is approved for use um, in patients with neuroendocrine tumors. And uh, like six or seven months ago, they approved a new agent, also lutetium-based, a small molecule this time, which binds to prostate-specific membrane antigen. This is for men with metastatic prostate cancer. Radium immunotherapy is a subset. That's what we love to do in the lab. And uh, the concept is even simpler. So basically, you have an antibody, which is specific to an antigen on the tumor, and you decorate your antibody with a radionuclide, and you send it on its way when you inject it into experimental animal or a patient. And here, oops, sorry. And uh, here you can see this is uh, the piece of an antibody, which is amino group. We have linkers, which are made by commercial companies, and it's sort of like a click chemistry. You click your linker to the antibody, and it's very uh, stable uh, bond, a uh, thiurea bond, and then uh, you add your radionuclide. Here we have actinium-225, that's from our um, multiple myeloma paper, but you can have any radionuclide, again, sort of click chemistry reaction, and here you have it, the labeled antibody. And then the antibody binds to an antigen, and this is that decay of the radionuclide. You shower the DNA or other cellular machinery with that cytosidal uh, particles. Very simple uh, concept. So uh, years ago, when I was still uh, working at the Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine, we talked with uh, Richard Gorlick, whom you all know, and also David Geller, and they told me about their recent findings that uh, they found that uh, insulin growth factor receptor uh, type 2 is highly expressed on every human osteosarcoma cell line they could uh, uh, have in their hands, as you see here that, oops, sorry. Um, that black bar, that's the expression of IGF-2R uh, higher than uh, any other, and they suggested if we could use it as a target for radium immunotherapy. So we put together a little study. None of us had special funds uh, for that study, but we uh, used mice from uh, uh, Richard's lab, and they were uh, carrying some uh, patient-derived osteosarcoma xenografts, OS-17, and we treated them with a commercial antibody which only bound at that time to human IGF-2R. And we labeled it with radionuclide rhenium-188, which back at that time we were using for treatment of our human patients with melanoma. And uh, we saw uh, quite impressive what I am doing, oh my goodness, <laughs> confused. And we saw quite impressive tumor control with that uh, antibody. So then uh, we were able to get another antibody, again, commercial antibody, which was uh, binding already to human and murine, uh, IGF-2R. So with that antibody, we were able not only to do the um, efficacy uh, study by uh, showing that the tumor control was pretty good, but also look at some uh, safety study uh, in mice. So that's where we were um, uh, in 2019 at the end, and that's what I was reporting at Factor 2020. So since then, uh, with our collaborators, we made new antibodies which are fully human using a phage display with Dr. Maruti Upalapati, and we uh, characterized them extensively. So these antibodies are designed in a way that they can bind to murine, human, and canine IGF-2R, but to the shared domain. So uh, in that way, they could be evaluated in any model, from a mouse to uh, client dogs uh, to human uh, patients during the clinical uh, trial. So uh, 
while we were uh, tinkering with those antibodies, our veterinary collaborators, and we are lucky to have a veterinary school as a part of our University of Saskatchewan, they evaluated the expression of IGF-2R in uh, 34 consecutive cases in dogs with osteosarcoma, which were treated at our veterinary college. And um, as you can see from that slide, 70% of those dogs expressed uh, uh, IGF-2 are strongly, 24 moderately, only, only six weak. And uh, the lower uh, slides, uh, you see that uh, uh, here is the um, uh, placenta, this is like positive control, and this is the um, antibody which is not specific for IGF-2, so it, it doesn't bind uh, to those tumors. Um, so what we did next, um, we imaged our mice which were bearing uh, xenografts. So some of the mice were bearing uh, xenografts which are human, again from Gorlick's uh, lab, and some were bearing xenografts which are canine, so-called Gracie. This is the cell line from um, Colorado State University from Dr. Tham's lab. And uh, this is the imaging technique, uh, SPECT CT. This is used extensively in the clinic for decades and decades, but we use the micro version of it. Basically, the equipment is made to image only uh, mice uh, or rats. And you see in those um, red circles that the accumulation in the tumor was quite good. Uh, then we treated uh, those mice with the tumors with antibody labeled with lutetium-177. Lutetium-177, if you remember my uh, third or fourth slide, this is now the isotope which is used for all clinically approved uh, uh, targeted uh, radiotherapy. Uh, it's very easy to make. Everybody and their brother can make it in their reactors or cyclotrons, so that's what we used uh, also. And um, as you can see here, um, the, there was quite a good uh, control of the tumor. What we didn't like, however, was a lot of uptake uh, in the uh, spleen, but uh, that's uh, the limitation of that skid mouse model, which was, I think, discussed yesterday. It has been shown by other authors that the spleen in skid mice is like a sponge for large biologics, and that's why, of course, we were eager uh, to move into the uh, canine uh, model. So uh, what we did next, uh, we imaged healthy uh, beagle dogs, both male and female, with our antibody. Here we already labeled the antibody with PET enabling radionuclide. PET, uh, for those of you not familiar with this uh, technique, it's positron emission tomography, computer tomography. It's now a golden standard for diagnosis and um, follow-up of many, many uh, types of cancer. And we saw very normal uh, by distribution. The antibody actually processed through the liver catabolism, as all antibodies uh, experienced that, and we didn't see any uptake in the spleen, which was really good. And uh, basically, we now got our protocol in treatment uh, of the companion dogs approved, so we are recruiting dogs. If you know your friends and family with dogs who live in Montana, North Dakota, those wild west states, we're actually only five hours drives from the U.S. border, please send it our way. Or we can send you our antibody, it's quite amenable for um, uh, overnight shipment. Our isotope is actually a long-lived isotope. Um, and uh, uh, in the interim, while we were doing the dog work, uh, we also had uh, Charles River Laboratories analyze our antibody for cross-reactivity to all normal human tissues. And uh, we showed that there is no expression of IGF-2R on the surface of any normal human tissue, which is great because it means it only comes out for unknown reason on the surface of the uh, tumor cells. So I would like uh, to thank my lab. Everybody is extremely talented, dedicated, uh, and we also like to party, as you can see from that uh, photo. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the uh, collaborators, nothing is able, would be done without uh, collaborators. I just don't want, I, can, I don't have any time. Uh, and the uh, funding from Wendy Walk, Canadian Institute for Health Research and some from Admir uh, by Innovation. Thank you so much.
I too would like to start off by thanking Christina and the organizers for including me in this amazing meeting. I'm gonna be shifting gears um, from the impressive work we've heard thus far from basic science research and from canine work, and we'll be discussing a first in human clinical trial. So I will be presenting YMAB's Therapeutics Trial 1001, which is investigating GD2 SADA in combination with 177 lutetium DOTA drug complex for patients with recurrent or refractory metastatic solid tumors known to express GD2. So GD2 has limited expression in normal tissues. It is expressed on CNS peripheral nerves, skin melanocytes, and mesenchymal stromal cells. It is known to be highly expressed in certain cancers of neuroectodermal origins, specifically melanomas, Ewing sarcomas, osteosarcomas, and soft tissue sarcomas. GD2 is a validated target in oncology based on the work of our neuroblastoma colleagues, and the FDA has approved two monoclonal antibodies directed towards GD2 for the treatment of neuroblastoma. GD2 is highly expressed in osteosarcoma. Um, we found as high as 70% expression in osteosarcoma tumor samples. Relapsed osteosarcoma specimens have been shown to have higher GD2 expression compared to samples obtained at in initial biopsy and at time of definitive surgery. Anti-GD2 therapy induces an antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity response by stimulating the host immune system. The COG previously investigated the use of an anti-GD2 antibody, dinutuximab, in AOST1421 for patients with pulmonary recurrent pulmonary osteosarcoma in complete surgical remission. This study evaluated the disease control rate at 12 months versus a historical benchmark. The events were defined as progressive disease or death due to treatment or disease progression. The historical benchmark was an inhaled GM-CSF study for patients with first pulmonary recurrence of osteosarcoma, which had a disease control rate of 20% at 12 months. Dinutuximab did not demonstrate sufficient efficacy in the study with a disease control rate of approximately 30%, and success had previously been defined as greater than 40% event-free at 12 months. Radiation therapy has not routinely been used to treat osteosarcoma due to assumed radiation resistance. However, it has been utilized for local control for unresectable tumors and also for palliation of symptomatic metastases. Radioimmunotherapy, as Kate so beautifully showed us in her presentation, um, the typical or the traditional one-step radioimmunotherapy is where a monoclonal antibody is tagged with a radioisotope. The antibody then binds to the target on the tumor tissue, and the radioisotope will irradiate the target. The dose is limited by toxicity, which is depicted by the red curve. The red curve is the blood concentration of radioisotope due to circulating long-lived antibodies, which are exposing the blood and the bone marrow, is in particular, to high levels of radioactivity. The SADA technology is a two-step pre-targeted radioimmunotherapy. So SADA represents a self-assembly, disassembly, bispecific, DOTA-engaging antibody system, and it's a concept that's referred to as liquid radiation. It consists, uh, consists of two parts. The first part is the tumor pre-targeting part. The SADA molecule, which is the antibody construct, is administered and binds to the tumor target, which in this case is GD2. Within approximately 48 hours or possibly longer, the non-bound SADA should disassemble and clear from the circulation through the kidneys. The step two is the administration of the radioactive payload. So for step two, SADO is once again administered and is cleared from the circulation. Then the radioactive payload, the 177 lutetium DOTA, is administered. The 177 lutetium DOTA can bind to the anti-DOTA segment of the SADA molecule and irradiate the target. The unbound 177 lutetium DOTA payload would then be cleared from the circulation within hours, once again, through the kidneys. 
So the SADA construct is composed of three parts. The anti-tumor part is shown in blue, binds to the target GD2. The anti-DOTA part in green binds to the radioisotope lutetium DOTA. The purple domain is the P53 domain, which allows the construct to self-assemble and disassemble. In its assembled state, it is in tetrameric form. In the disassembled state, it is in monomeric form. This figure compares one-step radioimmunotherapy to the two-step SADA platform. In the figure on the left, which is conventional radioimmunotherapy, the pink uh, bar shows the blood concentration of the radioisotope, and the blue line shows the tumor target or tumor um, concentration of the radioisotope. In the figure on the right, the gray line shows antibody clearance, and the blue line once again shows the tumor uptake of the radioisotope. And so as you can see in the figure on the right, um, there should be less toxicity to blood, bone marrow, and other organs from the radioisotope. So the 177 lutetium DOTA complex is a metal complex based on the radioactive isotope lutetium-177. It's a medium energy beta emitter with resulting in maximum tissue penetration of two millimeters. It emits low energy gamma rays allowing scintigraphy by spec CT, as Kate showed in her presentation, and subsequent measurement of 177 lutetium DOTA radiation exposure. So as I mentioned, this is a first in human, phase one, single arm, multi-center, non-randomized, open label trial. This trial will evaluate the safety and tolerability of the GD GD2 SADA 177 lutetium DOTA drug complex. It's composed of three parts and has a dose escalation based on a three by three trial design. The study population is adult and adolescent patients with recurrent or refractory metastatic solid tumors that are known to express GD2, specifically small cell lung cancer, melanoma, and sarcomas. There are 60 participants in US sites only, and it is currently recruiting patients. Part A of the trial design is to uh, identify the optimal GD2 SADA dose also looking at testing of the, dose, the optimal dosing intervals between GD2 administration and the low dose lutetium DOTA imaging dose and the higher um, lutetium DOTA therapy dose. Part B will be looking at the optimal lutetium DOTA therapy dose and part C will be looking at um, repeated dosing of the optimal doses of GD2 SADA in part A and lutetium DOTA in part B. Patients can only participate in one part of the trial. Part A, they can only be, receive one cycle, part B, two cycles, and part C, up to five cycles. The imaging part consists of GD2 SADA administration with the lower dose lutetium DOTA imaging dose. Patients will then undergo spec CT scan to see if the tumor localizes, or if this construct localizes to the tumor. In the therapy part, they will receive the GD2 SADA as well as the higher lutetium DOTA therapy dose. Anti-GD2 therapy does have adverse reactions, which we know from the neuro work in neuroblastoma. Infusion-related reaction sy symptoms are treated with antihistamine, acetaminophen, corticosteroid fluids, and antiemetics. Anaphylaxis can be treated with epinephrine and corticosteroids, and neuropathic pain, which is a common adverse event, is treated with gabapentin and morphine. The selected inclusion criteria, um, it's for the sarcoma patients, recurrent or refractory disease after receiving at least one line of prior standard systemic anthracycline containing therapy. For the sarcoma patients only, they can be um, 16 years of age and older and weigh more than 45 kilograms. For the exclusion criteria, there's a washout period of three weeks prior to receiving the first planned dose of the investigational product, and patients may not have received prior anti-GD2 therapy. Part A primary objectives are to determine the optimal safe GD2 dose and the optimal dosing interval between GD2 SADA and the lutetium DOTA. Part B will to determine the maximum tolerated tolerable activity of the 177 lutetium DOTA 
And then part C will be assessing the cumulative toxicity signals and safety profile following repeated doses and determining the recommended phase two dose. And currently there are five sites enrolling in the US, including City of Hope, where I'm from. And that is all, thank you. We thank the panelists for uh, just exciting very exciting talks. Any questions from the audience? I see Dr. Roberts. So great presentations, and I, I think it's uh, I, I think it's interesting to think about kind of how osteosarcoma in both clinical trials and in preclinical models has had different responses to attempts at immunotherapy relative to other tumors. And I don't think we've really totally s solved that, but maybe if we can just ask a really simple question for Dr. Yoon. You know, if we just compare like neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma, neuroblastoma trials from the very beginning had great responses to GD2 therapies. GD2 targeting therapies, osteosarcoma has not in multiple attempts. Um, why is that? And, and, is, and what's the relative expression of GD2 on osteosarcoma relative to neuroblastoma? Is it a microenvironment thing? Is it a dose thing? And, and will that be looked at in this trial at all? So that's a really great question that you ask, and it's a question that I've thought of myself. Um, so we know in, in, in the osteosarcoma papers that about 70% of osteosarcoma samples um, express GD2. Um, in the paper, in um, Mike Roth's paper um, in cancer that I cited in my talk, um, at time of relapse refractory um, tumors, they had 100% GD2 expression on their tumor samples. So I don't know, I, I would guess, just innately, I think that there, it's microenvironment plays a huge, huge role, and it's something that we still do not understand. Um, but in my mind, that would be my guess as to why um, there's so much complexity to immunotherapy response in osteosarcoma. Um, as for the neuroblastoma question, I'd have to ask my neuroblastoma colleagues what the GD2 expression is. I'm going to assume that it would be quite high, um, and I don't know why there would be such a difference in response other than to say that there has to be something inherently in the tumor microenvironment that probably inhibits the ability of the anti-GD2 um, antibodies to work as well in the osteosarcoma model. And I think that based on that information, that kind of led to this, well, maybe we should look at this two-pronged approach. We know that relapse refractory osteosarcomas can respond to radiation. Maybe we look at it both ways and tag the two together and see if we have a better response. But I, I don't, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but my inherent guess would be the microenvironment. Yeah, I, I just, just as a, just as a plug and, a, and it's a food for thought, I, I wish we would get more sophisticated about the way that we describe positivity <laughs> in our, in our tumors, right? Mm -hmm. I, and I don't know if this is even true across the board, but when we've compared our PDXs of neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma, uh, and this is a small N, but the, the relative expression is dramatically different between the two. And, and you know, we can say that there's 100% positivity and that every cell is positive, but if every cell has 10 molecules on it, is that the same as having 10 million molecules on another cell, right? And Correct. so. I, I think we might be better at approaching, because uh, we're gonna have more and more of these targeted therapies in the very near future, and we may need to be more precise about the way that we pick the right patients for those. Agreed. I just wanna add something. Um, actually, for that approach uh, of radioimmunotherapy, which uh, Dr. Yoon and uh, we in the lab also using, not every cell need to be positive. That's like a big advantage of using radiation because remember radiation is emitted in 360 degree sphere, right? And the cells which could be completely devoid of the target antigen will uh, still be covered by 
that radiation emission. And that's how you overcome, at least to some extent, a tumor heterogeneity uh, in, as opposed to any other therapies which are targeted by the antibodies where every cell needs to be uh, targeted uh, for, 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 to be killed. of the cells expressing a few. Correct. Dr. Connor. Yeah, no, thanks. I'd just uh, like to add uh, the sort of the topic of target dependency in the cancer. So to target a protein that's expressed on a cell is great, but it puts a pressure on the tumor. And if the pressure to lose that target as a result of therapeutic uh, exposure is to a target that's not dependent or the can a cancer that's not dependent on that target, the, the cancer is going to lose it and everything is going to go away. So I would add the urgency to define the target as not only expressed in tumor versus normal, but to do something to biologically credential the target as dependent in the cancer of origin. And I would add to Ryan's comment on the difference between neuroblastoma, neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma is not only the amount of target, but the heterogeneity of the target and the dependency of that target in the disease of interest. Okay, two more so, quick so questions. So the question I, really is, oh, sorry. Sorry. how do you credential the target as dependent in the setting of, you know, radiopharmacology? Is it different than what you would do as a cell biologist? Should I answer? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, in my view, uh, the reason why I'm so excited about INKTs, for example, so that's a cellular platform that could work as a living drug, where instead of focusing on a single target, you use the ability of these cells to simultaneously attack the microenvironment and recruit also the other immune cells. So the idea is really to exploit their ability to attack the tumor without having a specific target necessarily. Then we can think about potentiating INKT with a car, for example, which is one of my interests, or antibodies. But the idea is really that the first killing activity should spread epitos and then recruit other cells that not necessarily because of the specific antigen could be more effective in eradicating the tumor cells and obviously eliminating a barrier, which is the immune suppressive microenvironment tumor-associated macrophages that should wake up the immune system that otherwise inherently is less active in these patients. So that's one of the view, for example. So two more questions, one yeah. here. Hi, uh, Leo Mascreen is Los Angeles. Uh, my question is uh, for either Kate or Janet. Great uh, presentations there uh, by everyone. So to just take what Ryan said a little more, I mean, has on, on the YMAB uh, molecule, has anyone done dosimetry to actually see the amount of radiation sort of delivered based on target engagement? And I think the way I think of it in neuroblastoma, uh, I mean, it's the soft tissue disease which tends to respond to the antibody therapy. You know, when you use the radio labeled stuff, the MIBG therapy, the bone marrow and bone disease tends to respond. So I think the clue, you know, at least for osteosarcoma, the holy grail is probably the matrix which the cells make. Osteoid, which probably acts as a protective niche for these patients. And at least in my simple mind, I think unless that's addressed in the microenvironment, whatever therapy you have may only be so effective rather than completely effective. And that is why surgery is so effective for uh, osteosarcoma. So, so the question is, I mean, even though we know that osteosarcoma, uh, radiation can work in osteosarcoma in the microscopic disease setting, I think whenever there's gross disease, it's only palliative, I mean, uh, and very temporary. So the question um, really is, is there gonna be sufficient radiation delivered to actually have an effect or how much are you just gonna rely on the engagement of the protein to cause some sort of apoptosis or cytolysis? Um, so I'll go first. Uh, there is the dosimetry data, there is a, a lot of mouse data um, that was obtained prior to this first in human trial and um, there is dose, um, dosimetry data that's going to be obtained um, as one of the correlatives for this trial. 
Um, so I think that information is to come, um, but it will be collected as, as part of the um, biology component of this study. Uh, yes, and also what I want to add to what Janet just said, uh, dosimetry for uh, internal radionuclide therapy and dosimetry for external uh, beam radiation therapy is very different thing, right? So uh, by uh, the canons of um, external beam radiation, radium immunotherapy or radionuclide therapy in general should never be effective because the dose rates um, with uh, grace per minute or the total dose, ra dose is hundreds of times lower than with the external beam, and still it's effective in many patients like MIBG and the therapies which I talked about and Janet. So there are different mechanisms of actions involved, so like the uh, apoptotic um, mechanism, the uh, cell cycle arrest, they work uh, on very different scale than with external beams. That's why dosimetry is important, but it, it's not all which uh, is guiding us in the design, I guess, and follow-up of those patients. Thank you. Last question, Dr. Mill. Just, just a quick comment on gangliosides. That's what GD3 and GD2 are. They, they're not proteins, just in case if there's some confusion. It's a really complex pathway. We know from analysis that we're doing with RNA, looking at the synthase molecules for GD3, GD2 synthase, is that the, what's explained in textbook, that canonical pathways might not actually be that accurate and it seems that cancer cells can switch um, these, these pathways on and off, um, and it all depends on the promoter region of where the synthase is housed, and uh, there's multiple sites there that can be turned on and off, uh, and, and it appears that osteosarcoma can do this, less so melanoma, uh, but certainly the sarco sarcomas can. So uh, you might even find you switching from GD2 to GM2, um, and those pathways are, are very complex. It's, it's not that straightforward. Thank you very much. Well, we thank all the panelists for uh, engaging and exciting data and uh, conversations we have. <laughs>